next presentation is from uh, Professor Stephen Tyman, and he will be speaking on the topic of roles of root aquaporins under drought and salinity. Stephen, you are here? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Floor is all yours. Just getting dressed. Right. So good afternoon, everybody. Um, before I start, I'd like to thank the organisers for inviting me. This is my first uh, into drought, and it's uh, been fantastic so far, and I'm looking forward very much to the rest of the talks and discussions. So um, I'm going to talk to you about aquaporins, my favourite subject I've been working on for a while. And here's some numbers uh, sort of related to what Graham was talking about. So transpiration is some huge number, 41,000 kilometres cubed per per annum. That's about 40% of global precip precipitation. And we can calculate from uh, various studies how much of that goes through aquaporins. So these are the proteins in plant membranes in roots and leaves and other places. And it's probably about 50% of this. So about 20% of global precipitation goes through these proteins. So they're, they're uh, responsible for a large mass of flow of water through the system. And it's appropriate that we talk about aquaporins at a drought con conference because most aquaporins have their substrate as water, so they transport water. Okay. Ah. Right, so I'll just give a bit of a background about aquaporins from the sort of protein level, um, and then we'll move up to look at uh, some plant, whole plant aspects, uh, and then I'm going to go back to the protein and talk about something that's a little bit challenging because um, um, we found recently that uh, aquaporins are a little bit more complicated than we think in terms of their selectivity, so I'll explore that a bit with you towards the end of the talk. Basically, aquaporins are extremely high, highly expressed intrinsic membrane proteins, so you can see them on blue native page gels, so this is actually a protein gel from pea leaves. And uh, you can always pick out the aquaporins. They're at about 28 kilodaltons. This is a Western block of a couple of different types of aquaporins that we had antibodies to. And from many studies, we know that these proteins are highly regulated. So they're regulated through their transcription, through trafficking to the membrane, through interactions with other aquaporins, uh, because uh, in their normal state in the membrane, they exist as tetramers. They can exist as homotetramers, that is the one protein, as four, or they can exist as heterotetramers. And Francois Chamont had shown that this indeed happens in plants, and it's a very important part of their regulation. But in addition to this, we have other factors. So pH uh, has a strong effect on regulating aquaporins, both the inside pH and the outside pH, intracellular calcium, um, and also hormones indirectly through some of these processes. Christoph Morell's group has, uh, over the years, shown that there are many phosphorylation sites on aquaporins that also regulate their function. It's a bit like a digital switch. So we've got several sites, and depending on which sites are phosphorylated, you get slightly different functions. So quite complicated regulation. Um, we have crystal structures for two plant aquaporins. We have uh, plasma membrane intrinsic uh, aquaporin, Herr Shellbaum's group showed for spinach pip2, and we also have recently solved crystal structure for a tonoplast intrinsic protein. And these have been important because it uh, uh, corroborates what we know from animal aquaporins, that water flow occurs through the monomers. This is the tetramer of the protein, uh, but the water flow occurs through each of the four individual monomers of the protein. Now, I'm telling you this because it'll become relevant towards the end of the, the talk when I talk about selectivity. Now, I've got a big red arrow here. This is, this is water going through the monomers. They go down, it flows downhill, goes down its free energy gradient or water potential gradient. This red arrow is meant to, to signify that something else could happen. There could be a, a, a flow through the central pore. 
and that's been proposed for some other molecules that uh, are transported by aquaporins, such as CO2. Now, aquaporins exist in virtually every membrane of the plant. Um, they're important in transcellular flow across the root to the xylem. They exist around the xylem in the stem, and it's thought that they're important in refilling xylem after cavitation. And they're very prominent in leaves and also in guard cells, where it's been shown recently that they're important for actual closing responses. So they exist throughout the plant, and there are you know, 35 different isoforms in Arabidopsis and many more in crop plants such as wheat. So just as a blatant uh, advertisement, Francois Chimont and myself have recently edited a book on plant aquaporins where we have many uh, contributors from the field with chapters right across the, uh, the spectrum of the topics that aquaporins have been associated with. Okay, so... Tricky. Okay. Um, aquaporins can account for a very large component of water transport. And when they were first announced, uh, Martin Crisfields gave a seminar at a plant membrane transport meeting in the US, and he said, well, we've got aquaporins in plants, and they account for a lot of water flow. A lot of the biophysicists said, well, why do you need aquaporins? Membranes are quite water permeable. It turns out they're not very water permeable. In fact, this, this example shows that. So we've got here, we're plotting the, the CO2 permeability of pea leaf plasma membranes as a function of the osmotic or water permeability of the same membranes. So this is, this is a lot of information in the slide, but if you just bear with me. So you can see here, first of all, that there's a correlation between the CO permeability of the, of the membrane and the water permeability. And this is related to the uh, suggestion, strong suggestion, that aquaporins are actually transporting CO2 as well as water in some cases. But when we inhibit, and if we use this, this particular inhibitor, uh, silver sulfur diazine, we can get a hundredfold reduction in water transport. One hundredfold reduction. And you can see here that that shifted all these points across to there to very low water permeabilities. You'll also note that the CO2 permeability didn't change. It didn't shift down this uh, uh, association. And that suggests that water and CO2 are not going via the same pathway through the protein. Now, the other fact that's shown in this is the variability that one sees in water permeation. So these were membranes obtained from pea leaves grown in a glasshouse under very similar conditions. So the controls show an enormous variation in water permeability. We can increase that variation by subjecting the plants to darkness or drought. Drought tends to pull the water permeability down and also, uh, also darkness pulls it down. So there's a lot of variability and uh, based on the uh, inhibition by this blocker, which is also known as flamazine, which is a burn treatment, um, you can actually see the, the effect of aquaporins on the water permeability. I want to move up to the whole plant. And uh, Andrea earlier uh, introduced the, uh, the idea of measuring conductances and what, what that means. Uh, I'll refer to it as ease of water flow. And if we look at the various factors that determine how water flows in the plant, if we turn to look at the shoots first, it's obviously a function of the leaf surface area, the canopy conductance, the leaf shape and anatomy and the stomata. When we go to the roots, as Xavier uh, talked about, root absorbing area, root system architecture is important and root anatomy is important, but also aquaporins have a big effect on the overall hydraulic conductance of the root. And this, of course, depends on the different aquaporins that are situated in the membranes in the radial pathway. And we have the plasma membrane intrinsic proteins on the plasma membrane and the tonoplast intrinsic proteins on the tonoplast. Okay, so a question that uh, occurred to us, the group, was that if, if aquaporins are having a profound effect on the transport of water through the system, 
it might make sense that there is some sort of coupling between them and the, the final regulators, the stomata. The stomata are determining the rate of transpiration through the plant, but the flow of water through the different parts of the plant has to be coupled with that shoot demand. Otherwise, the water potential changes in the plant will be, will be rather large. So if we just look at leaves, if we plot the, the leaf hydraulic conductance versus stomatal conductance, we can see an association. And in this experiment, we also looked at the expression of different leaf aquaporins. And what was quite remarkable was the strong correlation that we see between this tonoplast intrinsic protein and stomatal conductance. In fact, it goes through the origin. So when stomatal conductance is close to zero, the expression of that aquaporin is close to zero. You can almost estimate the stomatal conductance from the transcript of that particular aquaporin. When we look at Arabidopsis, which is a bit easier to work with in some respects, we see almost as good a correlation, if not better, between this ortholog, this tonoplast intrinsic protein, and stomatal conductance. So in this case, if you measure the transcript abundance, you could predict what the stomatal conductance would be. What's interesting is the aquaporin is expressed in the mesophyll cells. We haven't been able to see it in the, in the guard cells. It's highly expressed in the mesophyll cells, but we see this correlation. So there's some sort of signaling going on between guard cells and what's going on in the mesophyll with this aquaporin. And Johannes, as part of his PhD, is knocking out this uh, aquaporin using CRISPR-Cas9 because we couldn't get mutants. And uh, that should have a profound effect on this relationship and potentially something to do with stomatal regulation. Okay, so we're going to talk about roots basically now for the rest of the, uh, this talk. And uh, the other question, of course, is this, if the stomata are coupled to the leaf, what about the root being coupled to the stomata? Now, we know that there are various signals going from the root to the shoot to inform the guard cells about soil water status. So there are hydraulic signals and there are hormonal signals. But there's also the possibility that demand, atmospheric drought, could be influencing the supply through the roots, through a signal that's going back the other way. And we're interested in this. And I want to talk to you a bit about how we measure root hydraulic conductance before I get on to how we look at that signaling, because it's important in the context of the signal. So we use the instrument that was uh, invented by uh, Melvin Tyree, a hydraulic conductance flow meter. And what this instrument does is uh, increase the pressure connected to a decapitated root system, which is still in the soil. So you can slowly increase the pressure, and at the same time, it measures the flow rate through the system. So if you've got the flow rate and the pressure, plotting those together gives you the hydraulic conductance of the root system. We then dig up the roots um, and then quantify the size of the roots so that we can normalize this conductance against the size of the root system. Now, the two points to remember here, we're decapitating the plant and we're also pushing water in the opposite direction to which it would normally go. Now, when we do measurements on plants grown in the glasshouse under identical conditions, more or less, we see an enormous range in root hydraulic conductance normalized to the size of the root system. So it can be tenfold or more. And this, uh, this really uh, upset Rebecca when, in her early days of a PhD because she she saw this enormous variation, couldn't work out how in the hell she was going to look at any treatment effects. So what she found pretty soon was that it was correlated to the transpiration rate of the plant at the time that we measured the root hydraulic conductance. So it's important to note the variation here. We're talking about tenfold differences in root hydraulic conductance normalized to the size of the root. So the size of the root doesn't make any difference to this, nor does the size of the shoot. What correlates with this 
is the transpiration rate at the time that we measured it. And here she's got different genotypes of grapevine. This is soybean, and this is uh, a tobacco uh, species. And if we put those all together, and here we're plotting these, uh, the root hydraulic conductance versus transpiration on a log-log plot, and you can see that the, the more herbaceous species more or less line up on the same relationship, and the woody root system is, has a much overall lower hydraulic conductance. But with grapevine, this intercept goes almost through zero. So if the transpiration rate's low, there's virtually no root conductance. Whereas with the herbaceous species, that intercept is positive. So there'd be some hydraulic conductance there when transpiration is off. So we tried to dissect that a little bit more um, to try and work out what, what's going on in the plant. And so we did an experiment with uh, grapevine varieties, Shiraz and Grenache. You might have heard of those wine styles. Uh, they're common in Australia. But they're interesting because Shiraz is more anisohydric. It tends to conserve or not conserve water, whereas ice, the isohydric Grenache closes its tomato very rapidly under drought stress. And so it, it remains more, its water potential is more stable under drought stress. What we see is that for Shiraz, we can predict the hydraulic conductance as a function of the expression of a PIP, a plasma membrane intrinsic protein, and a TIP, but importantly, also the water potential of the stem. We're expecting to see the transpiration rate in here, but it doesn't come in. We get much better correlations when the water potential with the water potential. With Grenache, it's a little different. We get a different set of aquaporins that can account for the hydraulic conductance. But in addition, ABA comes into the picture, whereas it doesn't with Shiraz. And remember that Grenache is the more conservative. It, it uh, tends to maintain a more constant water potential. Now this, is, this sort of thing's been observed by others in other species. So this is what we see for rice. Um, here they've uh, looked at the expression of uh, this PIP aquaporin, plasma membrane aquaporin, as a function of the potential evaporation over day, many days, and they get a good correlation between the expression level in the roots and the potential evaporation rate recorded 8 a.m. on the day that they measured the expression. So again, it suggests some sort of link between evaporation from the leaves and root hydraulic conductance. Okay, so just to summarize that, um, we've got, got the shoots here with the stomata. We, we know that there are hydraulic signals uh, to the shoot and which regulate the stomata. There are hormonal signals and it's thought now that in the leaves this transduction process uh, and the signal to the guard cells also involves aquaporins but I won't go into that. We think that there's also a signal from the shoot to the roots which results in this uh, very large variation in hydraulic conductance of the root system. And I haven't got time to show you all the experiments but we can reduce the size of the shoot by cutting off leaves and covering leaves to reduce transpiration, and they all negatively affect the root hydraulic conductance. Um, others have shown that uh, phloem ABA, when increased, will increase uh, root hydraulic conductance, and this has been shown in, in wheat. So we think that there's like a negative feedback system here and there's a feed forward system here. The result, is a more constant xylem tension in the plant because of the coordination of the conductances. Now, Francois has done some lovely modeling of this sort of thing where he's now, I think, in included this uh, regulation of root hydraulic conductance. Okay, so what, what is the signal? We're, we're suggesting from the correlations that xylem water potential might be the signal. When transpiration changes, the xylem water potential will change. Uh, we all know that from measures of uh, pressure chamber values. So transpiration goes up, water potential in the xylem tends to uh, go more negative, there's greater tension. So that's changing all the time when transpiration changes. So we thought that pressure might have something to do with it, so we inserted the cell pressure probe into 
transpiring into the roots of transpiring soybean plants and measured the turga pressure in real time as the plants were being manipulated. And what we found was that when we cut off just a few leaves from the, the shoot tip, there was a rapid reduction in the cortical cell turga pressure in the roots. This only happened when the plants were transpiring. If the plants were in the dark, we didn't see a significant reduction in this pressure. So we're inclined to think that there's a, a hydraulic or pressure signal that's being transduced somehow in the roots to adjust aquaporin activity. Okay, so we looked at the transcripts in soybean after we uh, decapitated the shoot. So when we decapitate, we're actually opening the xylem to the atmosphere. So any treatment that isolates roots or, or does this, or even when you measure hydraulic conductances, you're opening the xylem to the atmosphere and reducing the tension in the xylem. As soon as we do that, we see a dramatic and very rapid reduction in root hydraulic conductance. The half time of this reduction is about five minutes. So unless you're quick, you don't actually get the initial root hydraulic conductance. And that correlates with the expression of one of the, the PIP aquaporins that we measured, PIP 1.6, in the soybean roots. It also reduced very rapidly within 30 minutes. Sorry about this, I can't. My thumb's not working very well. So um, our collaborators in Zhejiang University um, made soybean transgenics overexpressing PIP16. And we expected to see a decoupling of this control because this was the aquaporin we thought was involved in regulating the root hydraulic conductance. In fact, that's exactly what we see. And, and in this case, under salinity, when we subject the control plants to salinity, we see a dramatic reduction in um, root hydraulic conductance. But we don't see any change in the overexpressors. So even though we don't see any effect under control conditions, we see a dramatic effect under salinity. Oh, yeah. So you could ask, well, um, why, why is this? Uh, what's this got to do with salinity? Oh, thank you. OK. Um, we found that these plants are actually more tolerant of salinity. So the overexpressing lines with PIP16 were grew better under 100 millimolar salt. And what we found was that there was much less sodium in the leaves of the PIP16 overexpressing lines. Now, this is very confusing to us initially. Why is an aquaporin affecting sodium transport to the shoot? Another piece of evidence in the literature, which is also uh, not well explained, is that in Arabidopsis, PIP21, which is the predominantly expressed aquaporin in roots, is rapidly withdrawn from the membrane under salt stress. So as soon as salt hits it, there are various signaling components, including ROS and salicylic acid, that result in the withdrawal of that aquaporin from the membrane, which reduces the hydraulic conductance of the roots. But the question is why? Why does it do this? And because of these observations, we decided to look to see if aquaporins were truly just water channels. And what we found with this PIP21 from Arabidopsis was in fact, it conducted ions. It wasn't just a water channel, it also conducted ions. And I won't go into details here, but the slope of this line in, is indicative of the degree of conductance to ions. And we show that the ionic conductance was basically carried by cations and predominantly sodium. This was done by expressing the gene in frog eggs that basically are routinely used to show the function of aquaporins and many other transporters. What was interesting as well was that the nearest relative to PIP21, PIP22, which is 93% identical to PIP21, is a good water channel, but it doesn't conduct ions. So it's something special about PIP21, which is 
withdrawn from the membrane under salinity, which allows it to conduct ions. And we've, we've actually found some interesting amino acids in PIT21 that might be uh, contributing to this. Another interesting observation was that when you co-express PIP21 with a PIP1, remember it was in soybean, the PIP1 overexpresses reduce the amount of sodium transport to the shoot. When we co-express PIP1 with a PIP, the PIP21, we don't see any sodium efflux from these eggs. We only see it when we express PIP21. This is the PIP1 control and the water control for the blue lines. So we, we see this sodium flux associated with PIP21, but when we co-express with 1,2, presumably forming heterotetramers, we don't see the transport. Now this is important, but we looked at the uh, sensitivity of the ionic conductance, not the water conductance, the ionic conductance to pH, calcium, and a second messenger, cyclic AMP. Now, the pH response is that when you go to lower pHs on the outside, the ionic conductance turns off. Now, that's really important because Peter Agra got his Nobel Prize by showing that protons do not go through aquaporins. Otherwise, they abolish proton gradients across the plasma membrane. But what we see with PIP21 is that it's turned off at low external pH. So the, the ionic conductance is shut off. And so protons, if they are permeable through the, 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 the uh, aquaporin, won't go through. The other interesting thing is that external calcium blocks the channel. So at higher calcium, we see a reduction. Now this, these two features are virtually, are very similar to what's been shown for non-selective cation channels in Arabidopsis roots. And we still don't know to this day what the gene is to account for this non-selective cation channel. But here we've actually shown that the characteristics of PIT21 are very similar to the biophysical characteristics of this non-selective cation channel. And our hypothesis is that it is actually the non-selective cation channel that lets sodium in under salinity. This opens up a lot of questions about what some aquaporins might be doing. Our collaborator at Adelaide University, Andrea Yule, has shown that this can happen in aquaporin 1, which is an aquaporin which is in our, in our blood cells and in our kidney. And it's important for cancer cell metastasis, this ionic function. And her data suggests that the potassium and sodium, the univalent cation, go through the central pore of the aquaporin. At the same time, Wieland Fricker has been speculating through a, a series of reviews that water transport and energy is somehow linked. And we've, we've seen this for, for many years. If you compromise the energy status of plants, aquaporins are immediately affected. And it, it's not been clear why the energy status should affect aquaporin function. A possibility is that it's linked to the to the transport of ions that may be co-transported with water. And one possibility is that we can actually have water transport driven by solute fluxes, or alternatively, solute fluxes driven by water flow. If we've got a local coupling actually through the pore of the aquaporin. I mean, at the moment we're, we're just showing all this stuff in heterologous expression systems. We haven't yet shown evidence that it's happening in the plant, and that's something that we're, we're doing. Okay, so just to conclude, root hydraulic conductance is normalized to shoot. The size of the root is very variable and coupled to shoot demand for water. Uh, this is dependent on the expression of aquaporin transcripts and also post-translational control of the protein. I haven't shown you much evidence for that, but there is quite a lot out there for that. It involves hydraulic and hormonal, most likely ABA signaling from the shoot to root, but is genotype specific. So there are differences between isohydric and anisohydric genotypes in grapevine. The influence of particular aquaporins on salinity and possibly drought tolerance may involve more than just water. 
and it may be linked to some sort of coupling with iron flow. And we're suggesting that the, the non-selective cation conductance associated with PIP2 may be the elusive non-selective cation channel that's involved in sodium uptake into plants. So just to finish these, uh, the workers that I've largely acknowledged uh, through the talk, um, and I'd like to acknowledge, of course, the University of Adelaide, um, the Australian uh, Grape and Wine Research and Development Corporation for the grapevine work, the Australian Research Council, and also the, the collaborators in Zhejiang University. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Steve.